How should we interpret the Bible? There's a very fancy word called hermeneutics. All this means is basically how you interpret something. And in the case of biblical literature, a hermeneutic is how you interpret the text. By what hermeneutic are you using to do your interpretation? For instance, two different hermeneutics people may use is what's allegorical compared to what is literal, where like they see the David and Goliath story, some people say, oh, that's an allegory. It's not what really happened. There wasn't really a person named David and Goliath that fought, but it's just referencing something. And there's some people that say, no, that's literally what happened. There was somebody named David, was somebody named Goliath as well. When we read the Bible, I'd argue we use just two simple things. Who was the original audience and what did it mean to them? It's a pretty simple concept, right? A lot of people, when we read the Bible, we don't really pay attention to the original audience. Or if we do, it's very minimal. We mainly just try to focus on, well, what does the Bible mean to me? What is it saying to me? And we miss the whole point of what did it say to them? What did it mean to them? To give you a few examples, I'm just gonna look at one Old Testament passage, one New Testament passage, and I'll even randomly generate them too, just to kind of give you an idea of how this hermeneutic is applied. So all I did, random Bible generator, this is what popped up, Malachi 3.5. So Malachi 3.5, it says, I will draw near for judgment and he talks about how he's going to judge all these different types of people. Anybody that does not fear God, basically, says the Lord of hosts. So who is he talking about judging? Who? What's the context of this? Who is it written to? Well, this one's easy, actually. You just go back to the very first chapter in Malachi 1.1, and it's the word of the Lord to Israel from Malachi. So he's talking to Israel in this context, saying, hey, this judgment's going to be on you because you're filled with all those people he mentioned before. And if you read all through Malachi, that's exactly what it's about. It's a great end times passage talking about unfaithful Israel because Israel was always going to other gods, but that's a whole other video too. But I'm just really trying to show you what the context is and how to get to the, the context for passages, what a hermeneutic should be. So what did it mean to the audience? To the audience, it meant they were going to be judged if they did not repent. Which, if you didn't know, they did not repent and they were judged in 70 AD. Let's look at a New Testament example. Kept getting Old Testament passages because there's more in the Bible, so I just kept, you know, generating a new one, and I got Mark 14, so let's look at that. So Mark 14, 7 says, For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. So what's the context? Who's the immediate audience of what he's talking about? What did it mean to them? Well, in verse 3, it says, While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the le leper, and he was reclining at the table, and that's when the woman came to give him the flask and anoint him. But even before this, it was two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened uh, Bread, and the chief priests were trying to arrest and end Jesus, basically. So the audience is a woman. The disciples are here as well. And it's at the house of the leper, Simon. So what did it mean to them when they heard this? Well, this woman anointed Jesus with very expensive oil. So naturally they were thinking, hey, how you? why did you do that? You could have even sold this money, not have wasted it. They viewed it as wasting. Wasted it on Jesus and you could have sold it and given the proceeds to help the poor. Jesus is saying that you're always going to have the poor. No matter what you do, you can't get rid of that issue that we have in life. There's always going to be poor people, always going to be rich people. That's just the way of life. He's saying, but you're not always going to have me. You can help the poor people anytime you want. They're always going to be around. You're not always going to have me. This was actually a really good thing that this woman was doing because she was anointing Jesus for his burial, like it says there. The disciples still weren't kind of getting it, though. They didn't really think Jesus would actually go to be crucified and die. But Jesus did. That's why he saw this as a great thing. And 
it's such a great thing that he said, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, this story will be told in memory of her. So this one was written basically as an account, actually. It was an account of the events that happened. And the audience was the disciples, like I said, and the woman at the leper's house. But you can do this with any passage of scripture. So whenever we read anything in the Bible, we always have to ask ourselves, who was it written to? What was the purpose of it being written? So who is the immediate audience? Like, for instance, if we read the um, book of Thessalonians, who was it written to? Well, it was written to the church of Thessalonica. That one's easy. So obviously, when it was written, it had to have some type of relevance to those people. And the same thing for when we read, you know, something like, uh, you know, James, who was the audience there, or uh, Ephesians, or whatever it was. We got to say, who was the intended audience that was going to be reading this, even Revelation. Who was the intended audience of who that was going to happen to? So that way when we're reading it and we see words like you, you know, the word you, we know that that you is talking to them, not us, you, but them, you, because it said you talking to a specific type of person. A lot of people will say, oh, this is my same hermeneutic. I always want to interpret scripture with scripture and see what the immediate audience relevance is. But when it comes down to it, when they read the passages, they abandon that hermeneutic when it becomes inconvenient for their presupposition. If you don't know what a presupposition is, it's basically something you've already agreed in your mind that this is what the outcome's going to be. So everything I read, I'm going to read it in light of that outcome I already have. So it has to fit into what I already know and believe, even if it doesn't make sense because I have to try to fit it into my square hole. We can't, you know, we always have presuppositions coming into the text, but we have to try our best not to let us, you know, interpret the scripture how we want, but let scripture interpret it how it's supposed to be interpreted. Let the scripture inform us rather than us informing the scripture, if that makes sense. If you like this video, make sure to like, subscribe. Let me know you what your thoughts are below as well. And if you think there's a justification for interpreting it a different way besides, you know, scripture versus scripture and audience relevance, what did it mean to them? And I 100% know I missed things because I'm not trying to go into too much depth here. I'm just trying to get a, give a general basic overview. Anyways, hopefully you found this helpful. God bless.